All right. Um, thanks for joining us. We have a very broad uh, agenda here. Um, it can go a variety of different directions. We're going to leave time for some questions. Um, but uh, I think we're just going to start by giving a brief background and context for who's up here and what their experiences are. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Miguel Azevedo. I, I run investment banking for Syria, Middle East, and Africa. So effectively uh, bringing opportunities to investors outside the region and investors to opportunities in the region. Uh, I'm Sarah al Suhaimi. I'm the CEO of NCB Capital in Saudi Arabia. I'm also the chairperson of the stock exchange in Saudi Arabia. My name is Rayan Faiz. I'm the CEO of Savola Group. Uh, for another few days and actually moving on to <laughs> becoming the CEO of Bank Saudi Francie starting uh, later this month. Hello, I'm uh, Rishi Kapoor. I'm co-CEO of Invest Corp. We are a global alternative asset manager uh, with a footprint in the Gulf, of course, which is our roots, but also in the United States and Europe, managing about $22.5 in total assets under management. And um, I'm John Burbank, uh, CIO of Passport Capital. Uh, been investing in emerging markets since 1996 and in this region since 2007. And after Saudi opened, I've taken a uh, large, large stake in a number of Saudi companies and uh, just put a lot of emphasis into that market and as it's changed. And so I want to put a certain amount of our time into Saudi and how it's changing along with um, our other topics. So with that, let's just start with, with you, Sarah. On, uh, on Saudi, and uh, what, what's, what's the most compelling, uh, where should we be putting our attention in the next 18, 24 months? Um, I think a lot of things are happening in Saudi Arabia and many different <coughs> aspects. I'll uh, speak of uh, what I know best, which is financial markets. I've been uh, uh, practicing invest investment banking and particularly asset management uh, business for the past 17 years. Um, what we have uh, witnessed in the last couple of years from um, uh, broad market reforms is um, uh, really compelling. And uh, there is a, um, a very uh, good success story there uh, where I think uh, most of the market participants in Saudi Arabia were a part of this success. Um, the Saudi market has um, embarked on a journey for opening up the uh, market for uh, foreign investors um, back in 2015. And since then, uh, there were leaps uh, ahead in uh, creating um, a system where it's reliable, uh, fair access to information, and um, uh, simplicity and clarity. Uh, for the foreign investors. That's why, w looking at what has been happening, you can see that the uh, Qualified Investor Program, for example, went through several iterations um, with the last one uh, last month, um, having less restrictions on uh, foreign capital to be invested in our uh, public equity markets. Um, I, however, we're trying to create an ecosystem. And uh, one of the uh, reasons uh, that we were able to move uh, in, in the right direction is uh, how seamlessly uh, different entities are working together in Saudi. We understand it's not just the Saudi Stock Exchange. It's the Saudi Stock Exchange, it's the regulators uh, being the Capital Market Authority or uh, the Central Bank all investment banks, brokers, custodians, and the listed companies. And there are uh, many uh, improvements as well um, in uh, um, uh, information and transparency that we can talk about uh, later. And How many QFIs are registered? <coughs> yeah. um, according to the CMA chairman last week, um, he has mentioned more than 120 to, to date. Uh, this number is significant because last year it was uh, less than half of this number. And uh, as the um, new regulations are coming and time uh, uh, coming close to um, an expected decision from uh, indices, the number of QFIs have been increasing rapidly. Do we, do we know how many are in the UAE? Does anyone know? Just a sense yeah. of proportion? Do you have any idea? No, I don't. 
Okay. My sense is there's many more than Much more, yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, we, yeah, we will, that are out there. Yes. Yeah. You will need to see this number in thousands. Mm -hmm. What we're witnessing is uh, uh, two things. First, how fast these uh, registrations are happening. Second, uh, we need to put things into context. Uh, UAE or other markets, when they were included, they have been on the watch list for three to five years. This is the average. Uh, for Saudi Arabia, we've been on the watch list just since last June. Um, and we have uh, been uh, on a big outreach program um, throughout different co uh, continents, talking to money managers and asset owners and just um, listening to them about their concerns. Um, and, um, and what, what are their concerns? Uh, in the beginning, it was market accessibility. Uh, and understanding our model. As you know, we were operating at T plus uh, zero while everyone else was operating at T plus two. So that was something that they wanted uh, uh, to change. We had the independent custody model, uh, market making, all those things are now already happening and many other technical um, uh, aspects. Everything from a perspective of being ready for an inclusion by indices is done by Tadawa. Um, uh, and this we know because we've been working closely with uh, investors themselves um, and with the indices um, in terms of uh, continuous uh, um, uh, improvements and development. This is something that will continue on happening and we have major projects coming in uh, like the clearing house um, by end of this year. Uh, and many other developments in the structure. And these were requirements, right? These were requirements not for inclusion of emerging market. It's a requirement to have derivatives in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So uh, let's say that uh, MSCI uh, does go forward. What, mm -hmm. what happens next? What will happen, you'll, you'll see a significant flow of um, like what, how number. Much? Uh, we, according to research, uh, I think and you might uh, know even uh, better than I do, uh, passive investors alone is around 25 uh, billion uh, and how big dollars. is the stock market now? Uh, today the market cap in Saudi Arabia is almost 430 or 440 uh, billion dollars. Right. Yeah, so it is significant. So, okay, passive investors yes. could be 25 billion, active uh, investors... Maybe more than that. Could be... Yeah, yeah. could be more than that and it's a different... Uh, the 25 billion will come anyway uh, into the companies that MSCI will include in the index, and I think they have identified 32 companies that might be. Mm -hmm. For active, uh, it can you know, be anything. The weight, what we uh, hear from research analysts, that the weight of Saudi um, uh, in the emerging market index would might be around two and a half percent. So it is significant, for, even for active managers. Got it, um, Miguel. What what is you're in you're in London or Europe? London, yeah. London. So what what's your perspective on this from from, from there? What do you think foreign investors think about this? <coughs> I, I think you know we can talk about Saudi, but I would speak sort of more generally. I I, I think when they they look at Middle East, the GCC, and even Egypt, for example, they see a lot of opportunities. In particular, in the GCC, I think people see nearly uh, the opportunity for best of both worlds. And by this, I mean uh, an emerging market um, profile in terms of growth, in terms of returns, in terms of opportunities, uh, population growth. So those, those dynamics that you usually see in emerging markets. But they also see uh, very specific features that are normally associated with uh, advanced economies. You know, rule of law, um, efficient, uh, efficient uh, and, 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 and working uh, exchanges, uh, investment grade status for the countries, uh, balance uh, affects stability, which is obviously the, the biggest challenge when, when it comes to emerging markets. So I think we have the opportunity of having both things. And, um, and I can see, and I think uh, uh, we, we just heard that, uh, there is also a big uh, marketing effort. Uh, the fact that the, the broader region is, is, is becoming a, a net um, importer, is attracting capital, uh, also puts it on the spotlight. 
Uh, and so I expect um, a, a very significant response. As ever, when it comes to um, markets that become better known, what we need is uh, transactions. And, and, and if we look at IPOs from the region, uh, you know, in the past few years were nearly non-existent. Last year, we have seen a few, a few you know, by the end of the year, we were uh, in the ad hoc distribution transaction. That transaction traded very well, and we need more stories like that. We need uh, sizable, well-priced, so that they trade well afterwards. And, um, and I think success will breed success. So this is the optimistic view of, of the world. Okay, so you, I, I can't help but think of Aramco, since you just, uh, based on what you just said. What, what, if, assuming Aramco does list by, let's say, the end of the year, what effect does that have on foreign attention? I think it will increase massively the awareness and the interest in the region. Um, it has already done that, I, I think. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's the biggest transaction in, in, in uh, history of mankind, so it <laughs> speaks for itself. Yeah, I've seen the bankers uh, every trip I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I make. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of uh, connections that have been in force for a long time, can you talk about InvestCorp's? Um, yeah, uh, sure. Um, you know, we, we started life back in the early 80s in the region, but initially focusing for the first 25 years of our existence uh, on the developed markets of the United States and Europe, investing into private equity, real estate, and other alternative asset classes. And over that period of 25 years, we've, through, to some extent, you know, mistakes, some, sometimes costly, sometimes not so costly, we've learned a lot, right? So we've got that experience of what constitutes best practice from the perspective of attracting private capital into, into companies and into assets uh, from outside of a given uh, region. Ten years ago, uh, immediately after the global financial crisis, recognizing that we had a very strong insight into the region, rather unique insight, frankly, if I may add, if I may add we established a third leg to our investment agenda from a private equity perspective, focusing on the GCC. Actually, it was, it was a slightly broader focus, GCC plus Turkey, but GCC was the big component of that effort. And since 2009, over the last uh, seven, eight years, we've invested in about 14 companies in the region. Six of them in, are in Saudi Arabia. We are by far one of the most prolif prolific private investors in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia from a financial sponsor perspective. And again, because we've been doing it for almost a decade now, we've, we've learned a few things along the way. You know, we have had some successes. <coughs> we've also had some, some challenges along the way. But at the end of the day, the ultimate agenda for any investor, whether it's an institutional investor, whether it's a private investor, that is looking to invest capital into a country to start with and into a company behind that, ultimately boils down to the same statistics, right? It's a return on invested capital adjusted for the risk that, that you're taking, which means you want return off and on invested mm -hmm. capital, right? And mm -hmm. Um, one of some of our key takeaways based on our own experience over the last several years is, you know, there are a few things that, at least in the short term, tend to alleviate the perceived risk of investing in the, in the region. You know, some of them are already in place. For example, the FX stability, uh, et cetera. Some of them are work in progress, right? Uh, easing the restrictions on foreign ownership is a classic example uh, of that. Some potentially um, require a little bit more attention. So for instance, you know, having uh, contract enforceability facilitated through arbitration centers, efficient contract enforceability, strengthening the governance structures, you know, particularly for minority shareholders, because this part of the world is still not ready for the classic you know, leverage buyout format, right? You are going to invest in growth capital backing well-managed companies, typically owned by the original founders that have a good you know, growth prospect going forward, and you're coming in alongside them. And invariably, you are a minority shareholder, protecting the rights of them and allowing them to have mechanisms through which they can mm -hmm. enforce those rights is important 
whether it's through the legal structures or the contract, ensuring that foreign capital is not differentiated from local capital is another you know, important mm. consideration, right? Because you can't have two different systems applying to the, you know, the same dollar that is being uh, contributed. So you know, these are some of the, the areas where having a bankruptcy or you know, insolvency uh, resolution regime. UAE has introduced that. I know Saudi is considering that uh, very actively. These are the two biggest markets in the region. So once that is taken care of, naturally the, uh, the rest will follow. And then finally, I think it, on the regulatory question again, it's also important, whilst reform is important, you know, it's also important to have a, you know, well in advance telegraphing of the coming reform, if you will. The Federal Reserve of the United States actually is the poster child for that, right? They tell you, this is what we believe today, and based on what we believe, this is what we are looking to do three years out, right? That is important because, you know, again, investors and institutions or private capital doesn't matter. When they are making a long-term investment decision, they are making those, you know, taking on board a cert certain fundamental set of assumptions, right? And if those are potentially subject to change, Mm -hmm. you know, over short periods of time, it throws, you know, a, a pall of uncertainty uh, that is hard to overcome. Okay, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, come back to some of those issues. I want to understand why you left a very stable food company for a bank. Um, <laughs> I can't comment on that here, actually. <laughs> I actually, think you haven't left yet. I haven't left. I'm, I'm still uh, the CEO of Savona for another few days. Uh, I think just going back to the... And going back to the uh, role of, or the title of the, of the panel, the role of captive markets in uh, foreign direct investments. Actually, you know, obviously we have been in Savola for the last couple of years, and for those of you who uh, don't know Savola, it's, a, it's a, a conglomerate with different positions in food and retail across the whole Middle East and North Africa. And when we look at foreign direct investment and FDI in general, the way I like to think about it is, investors will always choose the path of least resistance. And when we compare our experience, at least my experience over the last couple of years at the company, we've raised capital in different forms, different formats, different countries, um, and we have vastly different experiences compared, uh, depending on which path you take. So in Egypt, for instance, we raised $100 million from one of the developmental banks, and from start to finish, uh, that process took uh, at least a year. There's a lot of legal contracts that have to be written. There's a lot of guarantees, put, call, exits, etc. cetera. Um, and when you contrast that with uh, another transaction that we've done where we've exited uh, um, a small stake that we own in Amarai, and that was done through the capital markets, uh, all it took was two days of investor soundings and uh, two hours of building a book, and we raised 1.1 billion rials. That's three times the amount that we raised in the $100 million from, it's $300 million roughly, uh, from uh, the private market or from developmental banks. And I think the, the uh, role that CMA and the exchange and what everyone is doing in easing the access in and out of the market plays a very big role in, in actually making that deal successful. Mm -hmm. And actually, that is a great example of how potentially capital markets can be used as a very, very efficient source of capital uh, for the right story, obviously, and the right company, and um, do that actually with sophisticated investors. That deal was 85% covered from international investors. Only 15% of the investors had the time to review it, even though it was in their own market, to make a decision. On the flip side, international investors took two hours, or a day and a half, if you will, and got the deal done. So, uh, and believe it or not, that one billion rials, and we were running the statistics uh, before I came here, represents 5% of the total foreign investor inflow in all of 2017. So in single day, you can raise 5% of the total volume of the whole year. So I think it just goes back to show that CMA is very serious about it, the exchange is very serious about it. It's a very, very attractive source of capital raising, both from the companies that are raising capital, but as well for investors who are trying to get in. Because the path of least resistance, in my view, is not only one way. It's coming in and actually getting out. And if you have a liquid market, efficient, not that efficient today, but improving, 
um, and protected, I think you'll find that source of capital coming in and out. Mm -hmm. So we heard um, at lunch, we heard uh, His Excellency uh, Yusuf El Taiba talk about 10 years ago, 10 years ago January, and having the uh, uh, picnic with uh, George Bush and staff. And so I like thinking in five year uh, time frames. And so if we go back five years, oil was, I think, in the 90 to $100 mm -hmm. range. Um, the Arab Spring had happened about 18 months prior. Um, I remember people didn't want to own equities mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, FANG was about 80% cheaper. Mm -hmm. Literally, it's gone up 5x uh, since then. Um, Bitcoin had just spiked <laughs> up to a little over 1,000, so that was uh, similar. But um, if you consider, you know, it's always surprising when, when you go back five years and you try to imagine, you know, you put yourself there, did you imagine being in today's world? Usually the answer is, I, I can't believe what happened. So, so let's do that exercise, you know, five years if you can even get there. In Saudi terms, five years, I mean, given how much change has happened just in the last two or three. But, but let's think about, you know, what are, what are you imagining may, you know, may be part of your responsibilities or, or may happen to markets in the next five years? Um, a very interesting way to start thinking about that. I think um, given where we are today, and it's a big turning point uh, in behavior in general, whether it's behavior of um, regulators, stock exchange companies, investment banks, all parts of the ecosystem in, in Saudi. Um, and that means that for sure in five years time you'll see something that's completely different. Uh, the way I would see it in the rate that we're going and the seriousness of um, the, um, the government first for uh, all the economic and social reforms and then um, the part of um, the regulators and the stock exchange in reforming the market and the opportunities. Um, I really think that our market will be broader, will be much more liquid, transparency levels will have quadrupled or even so more. So you're MSCI, so anybody who buys an index yes. buys Saudi. By Saudi. Aramco is listed the biggest company in the world until Apple or whatever becomes bigger. Um, <laughs> what let's else talk has about in, in general, there will be uh, maybe much more uh, listings because one of the things that we're trying to do in the stock exchange, and by the way, Ryan is uh, a fellow board member with us in the stock exchange, is to position uh, the Saudi stock exchange as the uh, main regional stock exchange mm -hmm. and uh, have a dual listing or even have foreign com companies listed. So um, I imagine that uh, we will be very well positioned to capture um, uh, a, a lot of interest from companies to, to mm -hmm. list in Saudi Arabia. But today, anyway, we are the largest stock exchange in the region um, and uh, w the most liquid as well. Um, so if we're included in MSCI, that means that, um, first of all, checks and balances. And as we were um, discussing uh, moments before we came on stage, and I remember Ryan was saying, uh, the 1%, if there is 1% foreign invest investors today, that hold your share, you take that very seriously because it already affects behavior. Um, the way we um, communicate, the way com uh, co companies communicate with their shareholders, the way they make decisions, uh, governance, uh, there are uh, so much that uh, regulations can do. Like, for example, um, all companies now are required to have IFRS standards for, uh, for uh, uh, financial statements, but we cannot make investor relations a must. However, we have seen a huge difference uh, in the way companies are open uh, to, uh, to speak to investors and understanding how will that help them in the way they make decisions for, uh, for the company. And I think uh, Ryan can maybe share more of his experience, uh, experiences since he is a CEO of a listed company uh, who is now active in IR. We have witnessed, um, uh, at least in um, my uh, lifetime of working in this industry, um, the beginning of the early 2000s, if I call a company, they'll not, just, they'll not respond at all to any questions. This is, for them, extremely foreign. Today, they're participating. We have, uh, as part of 
in the outreach and working with different investment banks, there are maybe four or five global events happening in the next four or five weeks, and Saudi companies are uh, on all, all of those events and participating, many of them in all of those events, where uh, this is the time of the year where they can go and share directly with their shareholders uh, the results, mm -hmm. for example, of 2017. And this is um, uh, the, the move from no IR to uh, a, a, a very well done uh, IR happened for some of those companies in a very short period of time. Um, this is because of awareness. So I think this on its own will change a lot of things. So, okay, so uh, the, after the inclusion, whenever that happens, mm. what percent of the market will be owned by foreigners? Uh, well, Roughly. Uh, what, what, what's uh, your estimate? It's, uh, it's, uh, you're asking me to predict it. It's something <laughs> I don't do at all. <laughs> we would, uh, I would want to say that uh, companies that um, uh, actually have a very good investment and story, uh, we would like to see a significant amount of foreign uh, capital invested in it. And uh, this significant amount can, may vary in companies from 5% to 40% or whatever the limit is. So uh, we would like also to see, uh, as a market participant as a, and as a Saudi citizen, I would like to also see foreign direct investment of uh, major shareholding as well in uh, companies where in different sectors. So and this is what I can say that it, had I had the capital, I would have acquired, all, I would have taken over Savola since <laughs> there was no value attributed to yeah. Savola after the Almirai stake. So we applauded your, uh, your your move there. Thank you. But <laughs> so I have a bad joke. Um, zero to one. Zero to one is a book written by Peter Thiel to describe its elegant way of describing the creation of uh, a technology, a company from from nothing. Um, Zero to One also describes the change of foreign ownership in the Saudi market over 10 years. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Literally, it went from zero yeah. in August of 08 when it opened to only 1%. Mm. So <laughs> this, is, this is the rate of change that we've experienced so far. It's going to change significantly. Uh, the UAE is owned, I think, in the you know, high teens, yeah. yes. right, double by digits. foreigners. Yeah. Um, and Saudi is, gonna, is going to, uh, I think, be in the double digits. Yeah. In a, in a few years, and then it will meaningfully change. The thing is, if there's no foreign participation, then really you, you, you're lacking that uh, exchange of ideas of, you know, of human capital of, of valuation. I, I like to say if there's only 1% foreign investment, then the Saudi's, by definition, probably the least efficient market in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a very large market, but mm -hmm. if foreigners aren't there, it's really hard for it to be efficient. So. Saudi's been, it's been, a, you know, it's been it, it was held back for various reasons, and now it's raced ahead. Yes. And so it's, it's the effect here, like I, again, if I think I can see how the, the path of re relaxing regulations mm -hmm. just continues, yes. you know, given, given MBS and, and his urgency mm -hmm. to, to reform. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so if it's, let's say Saudi's owned by 10 or 15% of foreigners, you know, how is it different? How is it different? among companies? Um, from an investor perspective or from how, companies' perspective? How does the, but how does the, how is your market different? I mean... The, the market, I think the, the, it will be much more efficient as mm. you have mentioned. I think that there will be much more healthy competition which will lead to innovation and so many um, uh, aspects whether technology in the market or even innovation on the company's level those companies will start comparing themselves to global companies, not just the region. Today, if you look at many of our sectors, in the Saudi market, actually, we have a huge banking sector, which is a very good financial uh, and one of the top five in the world. But uh, how much for an investor that is not major shareholding is mm -hmm. owning from those banks? The minute they have more significant uh, uh, shareholding, those banks will compare themselves to global banks, not just regional banks. Um, food companies will do the same thing. Petrochemical companies will do the same thing. And uh, this will just create more opportunities to, um, uh, uh, for growth, whether um, it is to, for companies to come and invest here or for our companies to invest mm -hmm. also uh, 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 outside Saudi Arabia. So I think it will 
significantly change the behavior and we will not look at, our, at ourselves as just Saudi. We will start looking at ourselves as global companies and a global exchange and a real global market. So I think, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to build on that point. I think there is uh, an important role as well to recognize in the role of FDI in developing the capital markets. So not only the role of capital markets in attracting the FDIs, but the role of the FDIs, at least international investors that we see, in developing the capital market as we see it today. Even though they, they represent only 1%, uh, I think they uh, do punch above their weight. I think anecdotally, as far as uh, our experience in, in Savola over the last couple of years, and just to kind of uh, share with, with you a simple kind of story, when, when we announced our 2016 results, uh, it was my first year and we had, we ta we had taken massive write-offs on, on big positions. Uh, which were all one-time items, and we kind of explained it very well in, in our communication, uh, we're quite worried because the market was not expecting it. It's, it's uh, new to the market, uh, but any kind of smart investors who reads through it and understands what we've communicated will understand that actually many of them are just one-time items and you can move on. So we announced on Thursday afternoon, and I spent the weekend waiting for calls. No one called me. Uh, I guess people were thinking we didn't that call you? you didn't. <laughs> uh, people were thinking, let's leave him alone and see what happens. And on Sunday morning, when the market opened, it opened down 10%. And all sellers, and they're all retail sellers. And within two, three hours, we had done an interview. Obviously, the press release had come out. And all of a sudden, the market rebounded to actually close flat and then close positive in the following two days. And when we tracked the market the two weeks after the announcement, it was all international investors buying. Mm -hmm. So even though they today represent only 1% of the overall market, they did make a significant impact in the way the market behaves, particularly in our case, uh, where if this, this happened kind of five, six years ago, where foreign investors were not as active or not following the market as, as closely as they are, I think you would have seen retail dump the stock and never, never rebound. Um, so I think in, in that sense, think that 1%, what, what that 1% did today, mm -hmm. you can extrapolate as to what 10, 15, 20% can do in the future mm -hmm. as far as disclosure, uh, challenging management on best practices, sharing experiences of what they've right. seen in other parts of the world. And we certainly have benefited from that tremendously right. over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yes. And actually to that point, um, you know, Ryan is absolutely right. And, but it starts potentially, it starts even a couple of steps earlier, right? So for example, you look at our activity. We are not investing in the stock exchange, listed companies, et cetera. We are private equity investors. But a major part of our portfolio, we look to divest through a flotation on the public markets, right? We were Invest Corp was the first financial sponsor to actually list a company on the Tadawa. Lazurde, the jewelry manufacturer. Just today we filed for the flotation of a second one of our portfolio companies. In the lead up to that, we are able to bring to bear and apply many of the best practices that you would expect us to apply with respect to governance, disclosure, transparency, operations, financial management, et cetera, that you would want any you know, stock market regulator would want to see, right? And we are able to help raise that bar just a little bit, right? And it becomes a self-reinforcing loop because now that you've got the company you know, better positioned for acceptance by the broader marketplace, including foreign investors, well, guess what? They will be much more open and embracing to invest in it when it does float. And, you know, and so the yeah. cycle goes, <coughs> right? So there is, you're absolutely right. And you know, we, we have ourselves firsthand seen the benefits of that uh, FDI-led approach because it's, it's not just capital, it's potentially smart, experienced yep. capital, right? So there's intangible value attached to that. Uh, uh, John, if, if I just may uh, add here. Uh, if you look at other markets that are now considered developed markets, at some point in the past they were not developed markets, and even, even London, even the UK, the UK, the capital market in the UK, the equity capital market in the UK was very different post privatization of BP and British Telecom. Mm -hmm. So privatizations, they actually uh, play a massive role. Yeah. Those are the transformational transactions. Typically, those are the ones that also bring uh, retail investors and foreign investors. And so I think we are seeing this now. So 
from zero to one percent, yes, but uh, now you have the supply, typically uh, more stable companies, uh, larger mm. companies, sort of th that can attract more interest. So I'm, I'm very positive, uh, and I think you know, in five years' time, to your initial question, I think we'll see a market that is far more participated b by everyone, uh, far more liquid. And I have to believe, I, I, I believe in, in this, uh, all these companies will be allocating capital more uh, efficiently, and that will uh, itself create more opportunities. Okay. So let's talk, let's talk uh, this isn't a tech panel, but let's just talk about the role of technology in, in, in human capital uh, investment, you might say. Um, so there, we, everyone knows about the investment in the Vision Fund by uh, Mubadala and, uh, and PIF. Um, high profile, unexpected, uh, and uh, it's working its way uh, around uh, global markets. But uh, recently we've seen um, uh, some sizable investments into Saudi that, uh, or that, that we're talking about Google, um, Amazon, Apple. Um, so let's, think, let's just think prospectively. What role is there going to be? Uh, like, we haven't even talked about, I, I don't know if there's any Chinese capital in, uh, like in the Saudi market. Uh, I don't know how much Asian capital is, is, is really here, but let's, let's be prospective here. What, how is this going to uh, affect this region? Because it's really been bottled up, I think. And, and the safer it is, um, the more developed, the more liquid, the more, I mean, these are huge users of, uh, of technology, actually, on the consumer level. But what do you see in what you're doing in that respect? I mean, if I may uh, kick it off. Actually, you know, John, uh, if you look at the FDI over the last seven years, right, total FDI was about 183 billion into the GCC. Half of that came into the UAE, a third came into uh, Saudi Arabia. And of the half that came into the UAE, the biggest contributors were China, US, Japan, India, Canada, those five, right? So China is actually a major, on the side. Uh, yeah, on the industrial mm -hmm. uh, side. Now, some they may they may be, in fact, an element of real estate investment involved in in that too, particularly in the in the UAE, where foreign ownership of real estate, you know, has been uh, the case but dating back to the early part of the century. But you know, again, uh, I guess stepping back, you look at UAE, for instance, or Saudi Arabia, because both of their Vision 2030 statements are somewhat aligned, right? They are focusing on three or four imperatives, right? One is obviously the, the softer, the social infrastructure side of things, uh, which is education, healthcare. The other is the industrial infrastructure side of things, which is, you know, in one word, all about connectivity, whether it's broadband connectivity mm -hmm. or whether it's physical connectivity through tolls, uh, roads and, you know, ports and so on. But it is all about connectivity. And the third is, you know, just, uh, energizing the local services sector in particular focused on entertainment, tourism, hospitality, et cetera, because we all know that the GDP multiplier effect of investment in those sectors is the maximum, the highest, right? The, the middle bit, right, and the, even the first bit, a lot of that investment is bound to be focused on technology-enabled outcomes. Right? Mm. You know, investing in the broadband infrastructure uh, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is effectively, you know, mm. part and parcel of the broader infrastructure agenda of the, of the kingdom. Investing in the, in the healthcare sector or privatizing the healthcare sector and focusing on delivery of healthcare that is currently not even available to citizens is likely, more, like, more than likely to be a technology-enabled solution mm -hmm. as opposed to the traditional uh, forms of delivery just given you know, what the demand supply characteristics are and also given what the clear trend is, the trajectory is. Right? So uh, invariably, I mean, we see, we ourselves, as we look ahead at InvestCorp, we see those two in particular, right? Uh, healthcare, education, mm -hmm. and the, the industrial infrastructure segments as being key areas of focus for us because it's at the perfect cross-section of Big demand, mm -hmm. you know, keen interest on the part of the local governments to privatize those sectors and invite private participation and capital, smart capital, not just passive capital, and, and also in sync with global trends, uh, as mm -hmm. you see, you know, 
of what's happening in the United States, Europe, and Asia. So not to be discounted, the millennial generation will be five years older and five years, far more than five years wealthier and uh, closer to having uh, power. There will be a number of I think, transitions of uh, family wealth. I think, uh, you know, I think the, the, the internet uh, technology was pulled into the region. It was never Silicon Valley pushing it you know, here. Mm. Um, I'm waiting to see uh, what actions will be made as uh, I, think, um, I think it becomes clear this is a safer, significant place to do business. And I just wanted to tell a, a short anecdote. I was at the, attended the Allen Conference in Sun Valley um, the last seven years. And because they have George Tennant and uh, they have, you know, they, they're, 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 they look at the you know, big problems in the world, big opportunities, whatever. Um, every year there's always a Middle East, you know, bunch of problems panel. Last year the King of Jordan was there and he was actually feeling fairly confident and, and uh, upbeat. Uh, and there was a video about what Jordan was doing in terms of encouraging technology um, and what a, what a good workforce there was. And so, by chance, I, 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 right after that, I met an uh, economic advisor who was from Harvard, who was in Jordanian, I believe, uh, and he encouraged me to go to a, a little uh, meeting among 20 tech CEOs. And so I went, and I heard Barry Diller pitching all these uh, techs. Jeff Bezos sat to my left about how incredibly efficient and wonderful it was their entry into Jordan and how this was actually an opportunity for, <laughs> for investment. And of course, Amazon had just bought course, Souk. Yeah. It was the first time, it was the first time I saw this crowd look at this region as an opportunity and not a, a, a set of, of, of problems. And, I, and I've gotten the, 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 the feeling from the PAF conference as well as this conference yeah. that people showing up are seeing this as actually, there's opportunity and there's, it's different than what you thought. And Saudi is an extreme example uh, of that when, when, when you see it. Okay, so we have, we have 15 minutes left. Um, why don't we open up for questions and uh, we can see where this takes us. No, it's not. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. Hello, Rudolf Wells. Uh, so Saudi needs to attract a lot of foreign direct investment. It needs also those foreign direct investments to create jobs. And you were discussing a lot of things that, needs to imp or that could help if they are improved, like, for example, governance, contract enforcement, foreign ownership, that kind of stuff. But if you look at that list of, you, know, you could add, for example, improving the education system to, 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 to have more engineers, for example, that kind of stuff. If you look at the to-do list of things that could help Saudi Arabia, and it's super important to do it now, I mean, given all what's going on, that to-do list has been there for a super long time. Uh, what could be done today to speed, to speed the change? Like, for example, contract enforcement, that thing has been there forever. What could be done today, taking that example, to improve the speed of contract enforcement for foreign investors? I mean, again, it's already been done, right? The Saudi has, I think since 2016, established the Saudi Commercial Center for Arbitration. That is now coming into effect. And that is you know, expected to radically you know, improve the process of efficient resolution uh, you know, of contract disputes. So you know, like I said earlier, I think you're right. Many of these have existed for a long period of time. The good news is, that the recognition that they need to be fixed is already in place, and the pace of reform is, is fairly rapid, actually. Uh, you know, and we have seen, you know, most of the things that I mentioned that require attention actually are already getting attention. I think just to follow up on this, I mean, the last two years in Saudi Arabia have seen a monumental shift in the way the attitudes, not only of the population, but also of the decision makers are. I think your point is an excellent one, and everyone is recognizing this. And what happens is actually, in the past, it used to be, for those who speak Arabic, it's called Khususiya Saudi, which is Saudi special. You know, you, you know if you want to do something in Saudi, it's, it's a little different and you have to accept it. I think today, every assumption is being challenged, whether it's on the legal side or on the contract side or, 
even the, the exchange side. A lot of the changes in the exchange have been talked about for years, by the way. T plus two, uh, MSCI inclusion. Uh, I mean, they met the MSCI 10 years ago and nothing happened has, since. The leadership top down is actually demanding um, nothing to stop the development and the evolution of uh, the economic reform and the social reform and, I mean, women driving is a very good example. I mean, who would have thought, I know it's a few years late, but still, I think everyone you ask and say it's something that you cannot discuss. It may happen at some point when the society is ready for it. In between, kind of, you know, overnight it happened and everyone is accepting it. I think you'll see a lot of that going forward. I don't think there is a lack of ambition or lack of, of attempts. There's always a challenge on execution and bandwidth, which is fine, and, and I think everyone is going to have to live through that. But I don't think anywhere, anywhere you go and anywhere you, you speak to or any, any, anyone you see, you'll find an attitude of saying, actually, contracts are not enforceable, but that's okay. Uh, you'll never see that. I think everyone is looking at the core of the issue and fixing it. One thing, I, you know, just picking up, sorry, back to your, you know, what can, can be done more that would um, also significantly and in a positive manner impact some of the key policy agenda items for, particularly for Saudi, I think it's all about em employability, right? We talked about education earlier and that being the bedrock and, you know, the whole Milken concept of prosperity is actually based, one of the key pillars of that is in fact having that human capital uh, in place. But we tend to focus on education. Um, I, I think that the need of the R, particularly in this region, in addition to education, is employability, right? Creating a workforce that can be productive uh, in, in a corporate you know, work environment. So that perhaps requires a greater attention by corporates, and including the government, because a big part of the local workforce is employed by the government on vocational training, right? Training on the job, preparing people in a much more efficient, quicker fashion, such that they are productive, you know, in an optimal manner, um, which today I, I don't think is getting as much attention as my, it probably should. My, my own perception, I've been seeing the region change, you know, uh, more than, I mean, it just, it's unexpectedly changing, and now it's rushing, and then, um, I, I believe that um, there are many partnerships here waiting to be made between those used to changing things and want to change things, which is Silicon Valley, a uh, number of you know, innovators, and now a le leaderships that want to change without the, lacking some of the capacity you know, to do it. I, I, I just I find a lot of promise when I think five years from now what will have transpired, plus you have a Again, this millennial generation, which is going to, be, which is just going to be different, and which is going to be acting different, which is, which I think we're going to have to come to terms with. Yes. Thank you. Hello, uh, uh, I'm Frank Kane from Arab News. Uh, this, this is a question regarding Aramco, um, but I've, uh, so I, I guess it's addressed towards Sarah Sahemi. But uh, if uh, all your views would be interesting, uh, at the. Uh, Future Investment Initiative last October in Riyadh, uh, the, the Tadawal was very confident that it could exclusively list uh, the whole of Aramco. Uh, and I wonder if that's still the case and whether the other people here uh, think that that's uh, still feasible. Uh, in terms of uh, Tadawal's uh, readiness, uh, Tadawal uh, is ready and working for uh, any uh, uh, decision that the company decides, whether it's a dual listing, a local listing only, whatever the company decides, uh, we are uh, ready and prepared to do. But listing in uh, Saudi does uh, benefit the Tadal in the liquidity yes, terms? Yes, of course, so uh, it does, yeah. yeah. Ba back of the room. Oh, sorry. Uh, here. Go ahead. Hi, thanks all to all of you for your time. Uh, if you were a private investor looking to invest foreign capital into the region, Saudi or, or UAE, what would be the one or two key risks that you would worry about or that would keep you up at night? I could, uh, what are the risks? In, in my view, uh, I think John maybe can answer this better because he's actually put money in the region, but uh, 
being from the region, I think the risks are uh, more short term than long term. And I think through any economic reform that's going as aggressive and as drastic as we're going through, um, it will be, uh, there may be some pain before we see the gain. And, and that's normal and natural and everyone acknowledges that. So uh, in the push to employ, um, there are decisions to Saudiize a lot of sectors, uh, which is fine and that's, what's, that's what needs to, to happen. Uh, so as a result, there is a cost escalation that may come along with that short term before people adopt and adjust and, and uh, optimize uh, in the long run. I think it's, it's a much more cost risk uh, at, at the corporate level than anything else that uh, many of the corporations are going to see. A lot of it is embedded in the regulations that we see today. So uh, I think uh, there may be, I mean, the, the government has given kind of a path to, uh, five-year path in last year's budget as to how uh, they view kind of the cost escalations on labor or, or uh, fuel or, or power. And some of that has come through this year. So that's the only risk, but I think that's a short-term risk before the long-term benefit that will come along with the economic reform takes place. I would add that um, what is very attractive in, in the broader region, and uh, I'm not talking of Saudi only now, uh, the broader region is there's a new uh, economic model being developed, um, and, and this includes uh, Egypt, includes many other countries. And um, there's a clear intention of moving forward uh, in, in that. Uh, and if there is a, a stop and go approach, I think people will be very disappointed. The, the stable progression uh, in uh, a plan that has been uh, analyzed, decided, and announced, I think is critical for investors. That will raise confidence. If you have more confidence, lower risk premium, higher valuations. I was with a, uh, a head of a retailer, very well run retailer in Saudi uh, last week, who said, as long as just don't change anything else for six months, and like we're all <laughs> going to feel a lot better. Yeah. Yes. Uh, where, oh, who, who's got? Oh, yes. Okay. And then he added this after that. Go, no, go ahead, please. I was going to ask Sarah Saimi about uh, uh, how much is the government ownership from the stock market today is from the market capitalization? Uh, this and, data and, is and available. Did it increase, did it reduce during the last two years? Um, I'm not following exactly how much it changed or in the last few months. Is it the government? But this um, yeah, government, the government stake is um, uh, announced on a weekly basis. Uh, not just the government, everybody, retail, foreign, uh, local, between companies, between government and funds as well, uh, and discretionary portfolios. It's on the website every week. Thanks. Uh, I think a comment and a question. I think we should be, and I will basically what Ryan said about what's going on in Saudi Arabia in terms of reforms. I think it's like the past two years have been so fast with different reforms coming through, although there is mismatch between one reform and another. And I think the point raised by the first person who actually raised the question is an important point because from a judiciary perspective, the reforms are much, much slower from what that young lady is doing in her side or a lot of other people doing on other sides of the business. But when we talk about FDI and capital markets, I think maybe it's easier to handle. But when we're talking about direct investment coming into the country, I think it's not, I'm not just talking about Saudi Arabia, actually I'm talking about the region as a whole, but Saudi Arabia being the focus today is a major issue when it comes to legal redress, when it comes to setting up, and when it comes to really getting on with doing things. We know what Ryan said actually, the top down, the top, they are really, readily available to do things, but as we all know, to do things, it takes a bit of time. So the reform takes a bit of time, and there is pain, but we hope that that pain is gonna be very, very short living rather than it's gonna be a longer pain. Coming back to your point about the five year, where we're gonna be in five years, I think actually the next five years is gonna be honeymoon for Sarah, because she will have the most valued company in the world 
from a valuation perspective with it. But in five years, we're going to see the Amazons, we're going to see the Apples really picking up into trillion dollar valuation and more. So it's a question of where, and I think the last question about the government, how much they would own, I think after Aramco coming into the exchange, the government will be by a, by a large part the biggest player in the market. And I would say actually the foreign investment will be the second player, whilst the rest will be the thing. So it's going to be changing the way things will happen in Saudi Arabia. And that hopefully would affect the rest of us. I think what we will look at, and here, Sarah, it's for you, is how rather than having six or seven exchanges in this part of the world, in the Gulf, calling it GCC as you call it, why not have a one market which is yours and everybody comes there and be together? Because that's the way we're going to be. If we're going to be competing with the rest of the world, we need to be big enough to compete with the rest of the world. That's a question for you. Um, uh, actually, um, to your point, uh, this thinking has been happening at least the will and the intention from the Saudi Stock Exchange to grow itself and become uh, the main market um, in the region is there. It's part of our uh, self-imposed plans. However, on the other side, in terms of regulation, uh, what I know is um, the Capital Market Authority is working with the GCC, uh, other Capital Market Authorities, to have a much closer uh, regulations and not have them really vary. This on its own uh, will help a lot in uh, having um, um, the regional companies listed in our market uh, or the other way around or uh, have a dual uh, listing. Um, uh, I agree with you for in order for this region uh, to become significant we will have to have one main market and this is what we're working on for the Saudi market. Uh, all the reforms that are happening today, um, all the work that uh, is happening also on the side, in the other side, in the private sector side, in the investment bank side, seeing more uh, competition coming as well, uh, helps uh, to grow and innovate, and uh, it, it is a healthy competition. We're going we're to have to wrap up. I, well, I just want to say something that occurred to me. Ten years ago, in the U.S. market, corporate governance as a focus of attention was not really there. It really took the financial crisis, um, it took the fear, right, that if you don't manage yourselves correctly, very bad things are going to happen. And perhaps you could say the fall of the oil price, right, the challenge of a business model is the same basic thing. I, I personally, I mean, if you look at corporate governance now, how important it is, how, how primary it is in global markets, but really the US market versus where it was 10 years ago, it's, it's pretty shocking. I believe. I believe with a new business model, a new direction, urgency, and the lack of a democracy, where if you're going the right direction, you can get there much faster. I'm encouraged that I bet you we're going to be surprised, but you're right. That, that is a, a key risk for investing in the region. So thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.